don't be afraid of SEO. It's, it's not all numbers. You can actually see the progress that you're making. There's ways to measure it and just have fun with it. But remember, SEO takes time. So just be patient at the same time. But with SEO, unlike paid traffic, traffic stops once you stop paying for it. But with SEO, it's like a gift that keeps on giving. You put the effort into it, you'll see the results pay off. Today's episode is sponsored by the Artist Incubator Mastermind. If you're ready to take your art business to the next level, I'm taking applications for 2021. We're counting down the days. Just go to shulmanart.com forward slash biz as in B-I-Z to apply. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world inside a podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Well, hello. This is your host, artist Miriam Shulman, and you're listening to episode 112 of the Inspiration Place podcast. I am so honored that you're here. Today, we're talking all about how to use SEO to sell more of your art online. In this episode, you'll discover what SEO is and why you should care, how to do keyword research. We will give you some things you can start doing today and ways to help more art collectors find your art online. Today's guest is is a clothing brand owner turned business consultant and SEO specialist with 20 years in the apparel industry. She's the founder of Chase Your Dreams, which offers strategy, business consulting, and SEO services for clothing companies. Her goal is to teach creative entrepreneurs the fundamentals of SEO and how to measure SEO performance so they know if their efforts are working. She's the host of the Chase Your Dreams podcast, which is a podcast for fashion entrepreneurs who are ready to pursue their passion and make a living doing what they love. She's also the host of Apparel Business Summit, an online conference for designers and entrepreneurs in the apparel textile industry. She's been featured in the Vancouver Sun, National Post, and The Globe and Mail. Please welcome to the Inspiration Place. Glennis Tao. Hello, Glennis. Welcome to the show. Hi, Miriam. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. And also, I just wanted to share my appreciation for coming into my Artist Incubator Mastermind group yesterday. They loved having you. I learned a lot while you were there as well. There were some, some super ninja things that I didn't know you could do that I'm already using today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that. I find people, especially creators, get a little bit, they hear the word SEO, they're not quite sure what it is, so they kind of shy away. So really, I think my mission is to take the mystery out of SEO, that it's not complicated, it is measurable, and there's ways of knowing if your SEO efforts are working. So that's what I'm here to do. That's awesome. So I'm just going to make sure that our beginners who are listening don't feel intimidated. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off talking about what it is and why you should care. But then Glennis promised me, I didn't even know she did this. She analyzed my website. So you're going to get to hear what she learned about my website. So those of you who might feel you're a little bit more advanced, I think you're going to be interested in what she has to share about that as well. So Glenn, can you start off just for people who are beginners? Let's talk about what it is, but more than just what those letters stand for, why they should care. SEO stands for search engine optimization, which is the process of getting your website to rank organically at the top of Google search engine. And why is that important? It's because in an online based business, any conversion starts with the visit to the website. Yeah. And I have a lot of artists who say to me, they don't know how to get people to find their art. If that is something you've ever said to yourself or to me, then this episode is definitely for you. So let's talk about the very, very simple things first, Glennis, and then we'll get more advanced as we move along in the conversation. How would somebody do some simple keyword research if they wanted to get started? 
for example, we talked yesterday about somebody maybe wants to sell pet portraits. What might they need to do? Keyword research is important. It's a starting point for any SEO strategy in terms of you're finding content topics and doing on-page SEO and outreach and promotion. So a good place to start, you would want to probably start by doing a little bit of brainstorming, thinking of a list of topics and what you want to talk about, especially if you're in the process of creating content or writing blogs and so on and so forth. You want to really know and understand what the audience wants to know. And so you can get some keyword ideas, perhaps using Wikipedia and looking up certain topics. In Wikipedia, actually, there's a section with contents in there and you can see different topics. For example, if you're looking for fine art ideas. Also, you can go on to different search forums like Quora, Reddit, just to see what kind of questions people are asking about and wanting to know. Google Trends is another good place to sort of get ideas. So that is really great advice for somebody who is an art teacher and maybe they want to get ideas for live streams. And by the way, this was something I didn't really know yesterday until all of a sudden it showed up when Glennis was talking to our group that you can actually research questions people are asking. What was the name of that site that you had up? We plugged in pet portraits and I saw that the most frequent question is how much to charge for pet portraits. I was like, oh, that would make a good topic for a live yeah, stream. Yeah, I was using SEM Rush, which is a great tool for doing keyword research. I have a paid subscription to it because I do SEO for work, but they also have certain free things that you can do using that tool. But there's other tools as well for doing keyword research. So there's a Google Keyword Planner, which is part of Google AdWords. However, it's kind of limited in what the keywords they can give you. So you can use other tools like SEM Rush is what I had talked about, but there's Uber Suggest which is Neil Patel's free keyword research SEO planning tool. There's keywords everywhere. There's keyword finder. So tools like that are a good place to start to do your keyword research. So the first part where we talked about getting ideas for content, that is really useful for somebody who is a content creator, like an art teacher. But somebody whose content is their artwork, they really need to find out what are the words people are searching for? So you could assume it's pet portraits, but that may not be what people are searching for. They may be searching for hand-drawn illustrations or painting from photo. So where would you suggest they look if they wanted different keyword phrase ideas that they should be using to describe their artwork to help people find them on Google or on Etsy or wherever it is that they are posting their artwork? Mm -hmm. So say if you are an artist that specializes in pet portraits, or more specifically, maybe custom pet portraits, that could be a good starting point for you and researching the keyword pet portraits. And we did this as an exercise yesterday and plugged that into SEM Rush to see what the keyword search volume was for that particular keyword, pet portraits. And it turned out to be around 1600. And that was in Canadian and US, it was a lot higher. That's a pretty good number. 1,600 people in Canada were searching for the words pet portraits, and that's over what period of time? A month? Yes, that's a month, but it's an average month. The over 12-month period, it's the average. So that number could be a lot higher in November when people are thinking about gifts, perhaps, and maybe not so much in August. I don't know, making this up. And then just for all my pet painter lovers out there, that number was much higher for the U.S. It was something like 8,000, I want to say. It was like 18,000. It was 18,000. Yeah, it was a lot bigger. (laughs) Yes. It was a lot bigger. (laughs) Yeah. Just had to make sure we were very clear, first of all, what that number meant and also how much higher it was in the U.S. Okay, so we we established how people who maybe are content creators and they are creating blog post content, podcast content, live stream content can look for topics to teach as well as people who their product is their art, how they can describe it using keywords. I think it's going to be super fun now 
if we turn the tables a little bit and talk about, all right, you already have a website. How is it doing? And I am bravely going to, I don't even know what she found out, bravely going to let Glennis just tell me what's going on in my website. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't even know oh what you're going to say. <laughs> this is the curtains. My Mia Shulman's website. I'm naked online. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Thank you, Miriam, for offering to use your website as an example here. But I did do a quick website audit on your site, shulmanart.com. There are a lot of web pages scanned. I put in 1,000 as a limit, but I think you had a lot more than that. I mean, my first impression of your website, I mean, it's very good indication. Like, I love the, the colors and having your art feature on the front. Uh, your homepage, it looks like you have your podcast episodes there as the features. So if that is your intent, I'm trying to understand like the reasoning behind that, why you decided to put your podcast episodes on the front page. Yeah. So I have three parts right now of my business. I still sell art. It's actually hosted on a Shopify site. It's actually a different domain. It's like a subdomain of Shulman Art, art art.shulmanart.com. So that's where all my art is for sale. When I added the podcast two years ago, that's when I decided I really needed a WordPress site because I just couldn't make my Shopify site do what WordPress did. And I didn't want to move everything over. Yeah, because I noticed you do have the subdomain art.shulmanart.com as well as shulmanart.com and perhaps some other landing pages as well that may have been just separate creators landing pages. In terms of that, Google's going to be crawling those each as separate websites, right? Mm. And so you're going to have to work on the SEO of all of those URLs and subdomains, domains and subdomains. And so that could require a bit more effort, Mm. right, In, in doing so. So that's probably one thing I'd want to mention to you. The main thing that I noticed, you have quite a bit of traffic. Why don't we start with one of those numbers that I was proud of from yesterday? So that was my Google, the ranking number. I remember seeing yes. that yesterday. Let's start there. You can pick me apart it later. Was your backlinks that you had over 36,000 backlinks. Well, and so how about- is that possible? <laughs> well, you must have gotten a lot of press and doing some pretty good work there and getting your, yourself known and building a lot of brand awareness. You sure that's not just so, pins? <laughs> um, I can actually go in and see what they are. I'm talking about Pinterest, right? Like It could like, be. A lot of it comes from inspirationplace.net. So you're probably maybe linking back from... Cause yeah, so, oh, so you have another website called the correct. inspirationplace.net. So I have my Shopify site that I used to sell art. I have my WordPress site for my podcast. And I have a Kajabi site for my online classes. And that's the inspirationplace.net. So everything links to each other. Yeah. So you have a lot of backlinks from within your own domain website. So from the inspirationplace.net back to shulmanart.com. Okay. That's what it looks like a lot of them are coming from. Okay. It looks like there's some blogs. Okay. So I was going to say it's probably also from my own. So... I am old enough that I have a Blogspot blog, and it wasn't because I was too cheap to pay for WordPress. It's because when I started my blog, WordPress was not the obvious choice. I mean, this was well over 15 years ago. They just kept adding all these features to WordPress, and there was one day I just said, no, I can't take it anymore. I have to switch it. And then it looks like there's artswestchester.org. Yep, that's my local place. Tell me if you agree or disagree. Sometimes I will join an art association just so that I have a a link on their site because I know how good that is for SEO. Am I right? Okay, she's nodding her head vigorously for those of you who can't see her. (laughs) I am nodding my head because that is a part of a link building strategy, getting your site listed on directories. Artist association is a good place to be on, right? Yeah. Being part of, as a member, you get featured and listed on their website. Yeah, and I'm not only doing it for the link. There's also other benefits, other benefits too. If you're ever wondering if some kind of advertising is worth it, if it gets you a link and a place that will get you traffic and the website is a really good website, it can be very worth it. Can you talk about what the page rank means? 
because that's something that you shared yesterday and how that works. I talked about domain authority. Domain authority has to do with your website's ability to rank on Google search engine results. It's usually between the zero and 100 because if you're a brand new website, you probably have zero domain authority. 100 being good, the highest. So for example, sites like Wikipedia, Facebook, YouTube, they would be up in the high 90s, close to 100, right? Domain authority. You can check your domain authority by installing a Chrome extension. It's called Mozbar extension, M-O-Z, a Mozbar extension, Chrome, and you can see the domain authority of any website. You can also check your competitor's domain authority. You can check your own and see how you compare against your competitors, right? So that's a good starting point for SEO, competitive analysis. So along with your keyword research, you'll be doing competitive analysis at the same time. I will share that my domain authority is 25. Was that the number? Yes. Okay. So anybody can look that up. So if I were to do this strategy with getting links on other places, what number domain authority should the other person have for it to be worth my while? Like, let's say Arts Westchester, if I were to plug them into Moz Bar and it spits out a number, would I be looking for something that's much bigger than 25 or would it be okay to have a bunch of ones that are 10? You want to be sort of within the vicinity of where your competitors lie. If, if you're trying to compare yourself to, say, a very, very famous artist who's well-established their site could have a very high domain authority. I wouldn't necessarily say that they're your competitor, Mm. right? Say if they have a domain, I don't know, just throw it a a really famous artist. Ashley Longshore. She was on episode number one, by the way, anyone who's an Ashley Longshore fan who is listening, you can listen to my interview of her. It's still one of my favorites. And I don't normally have a lot of artists on the show. I have a lot of people who help artists on the show in whatever capacity, either somebody like, Glennis, who we have today, who helps people with the marketing side. I have a lot of people who help with the mindset side. And then occasionally I will have an artist also come either because they have a lesson to teach in one of those things or somebody like Ashley, who I just really admire. Mm. So I have the results for AshleyLongshore.com. They have a domain authority score of 38. Okay. Their organic search traffic is 20,000. They get 20,000 visits to their website every month and they're ranking for 341 keywords. So the domain authority of 38, so yours is 25. I mean, that's not too far off, right? That's not a really huge gap. It's not like she's in 60s or 70s. So I would say, you know, that's probably a good comparison as a competitor when you're trying to do your competitor research. If she also does similar type of artwork, like mixed media type of art, and you're a mixed media artist as well. So you want to go in there and see what keywords that she's ranking for. Okay, so she does pop art. So we we do different kinds of art, but what kind of keywords is she ranking for? And then I want to switch it back to my research because we didn't go over what words I'm ranking for. Keywords she's ranking for. I'm ready for you to say a dirty word because her art is is out there. (laughs) Well, I think on her Instagram, she says my favorite word is the F word. Like that's her Instagram bio. Well, it depends how many times she uses the F word on her. Yeah, let's hope she's not ranking for the F word. It's not coming up as number one. Like that would not be a good thing. Even even I think in her mind, I don't think that's what she wants to be ranking for. I don't think she'd want to rank for that necessarily. definitely not. It looks like she's ranking a lot for her own name. Okay. So Ashley Longshore, artist, Ashley Longshore Gallery. She's number one for pretty much everything with her name in it. Okay. Which makes sense because she's a famous artist. Yeah. So it makes sense. If people are look, know of her, they'll probably be searching for her, her name, right? Yeah. So she's not ranking for her subject, actually. She's not ranking for pop art or portrait art. I don't see that. Okay. So she did the same thing I do, by the way. She has a Shopify site that's a subdomain. So it is possible that on her subdomain, she is ranking for some of those 
those keyword phrases that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm so sorry to interrupt this juicy conversation, but I just wanted to make sure that you knew that I am taking applications for the Artist Incubator Mastermind. If you're lacking a solid strategy or a winning mindset and you're disappointed with your current art sales, I can help you. If you've been listening to this podcast and you found my tips helpful, then maybe it's time to take the next logical step and work with me on a deeper level. The Artist Incubator Mastermind is for professional artists who want to take their art business up to the next level and create a sustainable business. Like I said, I'm already reviewing applications for 2021. Ready to invest in your art career and join this dynamic community? You can go to shulmanart.com forward slash biz as in the letter B-I-Z to apply now. Back to the show. Last night, we're talking about ranking for keywords. And when I did this research some time ago in Google, I think it was Google Webmaster. I'm not even sure if that's a tool that's available anymore. Turned out I was ranking for ships. Why am I ranking for ships? Well, it's because... Ships in a few days, ships for free. (laughs) So you have to be a little bit careful sometimes about what words you're ranking for, if they actually make sense for your website. It's like, that's not exactly the word I wanted to be ranking for. Okay, so let's switch back to my website. Glennis, what keywords am I ranking for? So number one position, what you're ranking for is permanent watercolor paints. Okay. Miriam Shulman podcast, water painting techniques for sand. Okay. Water paint properties watercolor pigments guide, washi tape art, how to make sand color, watercolor, how to paint sand with watercolor is, are these all relevant? Actually, yes. Like the, some <laughs> of those are blog posts that I've written. So Yay, yes you go. to all of those things. Okay, that's good. So yes, you are ranking like within the first page of Google, which are the top 10 results. Only if they're looking for that specific, they want to paint sand. If they are looking for like, even most popular brown paint color. <laughs> I think it, there's a search volume of 30. Popular okay. brown paint colors has a search volume of 140. So that's what you're ranking for right now. So talking in terms of keywords, right? Like we have head terms, keywords, which could just be like fine art. Or you can talk about something like having a long tail keyword that somebody could be looking for that contains perhaps four or five words in the search. And that could be in a form of questions. So who are fine art artists or, you know, how to paint fine art paintings or something like that you could also go for, which is a long tail keyword. Okay. And then one thing that I wanted to make sure people understood that we talked about last night was that you have to be careful about only going for volume because obviously if you put in the word art as your keyword, there's millions of people searching for art, but it's too competitive to rank for art. Almost every day I get these, these emails from people. They want to teach me how to do SEO. They want to teach me how to do Instagram, but it's not they want to teach me. Usually it's, they, you know, they want me as a client and they'll say, you're not ranking on the first page for art. Like, okay, well, clearly you don't know what you're doing if that's what you want me to rank for. So I I could just delete this right now. You don't need to rank on the first page for art. You want to be ranked very specifically like we talked about. So for me, watercolor techniques is something good to be ranking for. For my client who we were talking to last night, she had a pink watercolor flower. So we were talking to her about some of the better ways to describe that and do research on that. Glennis, do you want to take over about what ideas we shared with her about the kinds of phrases that she should be researching? Yeah, well, we talked about being more specific in terms of describing what the art was, perhaps the technique, whether it's watercolor or whatever. Just my opinion, though, is that collectors, they're more interested in what it is than how it's created, whereas artists are more interested in how it's created. So you need to be careful. Like it's good for me to be ranking on technique because I'm trying to attract people to take my watercolor classes. Mm. But if I were selling that pink flower, I would lean more into, well, is it a pink peony or a pink rose? Because I know those are two types of flowers that people might be looking for. Yes. Hopefully it's not a pink carnation. People are not looking for pink carnation art. 
and pink flower art could be popular, but I'm afraid that would fall into the too broad category again. Yeah, it would probably be too generic and you'd probably be lost in the search and the amount of keywords that are out there for, for just flower. So if you say pink peony, if somebody is searching for pink peony art painting, then they're more likely to find you. If they're that specific, they're really close to making a purchase. Yeah. Because they're looking for something specific, right? If they're just looking for pink flower, that's so, so generic, right? They could just be, you know, trying to look for just some images or whatever. But like you said, you know, really, what is the intent? If it's to make a sale, you probably want to think about the person who's searching. What keywords would they be using to look for that art, right? And like you said, pink peony painting would probably be closer to what somebody is looking for to purchase. If they're looking to how to draw or how to paint a pink peony, you could probably talk more in terms of the type of technique. If it's more of an informational versus more of a commercial intent. So really think about the intent there as well. Also, I would advise people, and I know this because this is something that I ran into myself. Let's say you have a painting of lemons. Now, fruit art is something that if you do the Google research, there's a high search volume, low competition. But here's what I want to caution you to do. You always want to take that search phrase that you came up with and put it into Google and see what comes up. Because for fruit art, you will not find paintings of fruit. You will find fruit sculptures that people make that they send as gift baskets. That's what Google is is showing people who are searching for fruit art. So sometimes the keywords that you come up with may not really match what your customer is looking for. Glennis, I'm going to pass the mic to you in a moment, but could you explain what happens if you actually kind of mislead the customer? And this is a way that you might be misleading them unintentionally. How would Google penalize you? Well, if they happen to be doing a search for fruit art, looking for fruit or basket arrangement, and they land on a site with fruit pictures of fruit paintings, and that's not what they're looking for, then well, what do you think they're going to do? they're going to leave the site, right? And so that's going to create a high bounce rate for you. And that's going to cause Google to say, well, the keyword that they're ranking for is not relevant because people land on the page and then they leave after two seconds. So you want to make sure you're using keywords that are relevant. Then talk, say, fruit paintings or something that describes it, right? And so like you said, while you're doing keyword research, type in the keywords and see what the results come see what the top results are for fruit art and see what actually it is. Are they pictures of fruit? Are they fruit baskets, arrangements? The reason why you want to make sure that the keyword phrase you come up with is relevant is when you are crafting your keyword phrases for, let's just, whether it's on your own website whether it's on a venue that you sell on, be it Etsy or Fine Art America. So they give you a place to put your title in and they limit how many characters you should use. So if you want to put keyword phrases in that title to help people find you and you're limited to how many letters. And now here, I'm not sure which, which phrases are the best because I didn't research ahead of time. So I don't use this as the exact advice, but let's say with the pink peony. That's probably a good example. You may want to start with pink peony art. And then the next phrase might be watercolor art and flower painting and then floral art. So you go through that. You can only use a certain number. So you want to make sure that all of those are relevant. Now, if it is not an original and it's a print, you have to be very careful because floral print describes all the floral print dresses in the world. So these are examples of where you want to make sure you use the right keywords the most specific ones that people are actually searching for to find what it is that you're offering. And that's going to help you sell more art, especially on some of these sites that we said, maybe your own website only has a domain authority of a zero or a one because you're just getting started. But Etsy has a very high domain authority. So when you're posting your art there, you are kind of riding on their coattails of having a very high domain authority website that you are showing your art on. And it's basically 
all the, the stuff we're talking about with how to choose keywords, this stuff is important, whether it's for your own website or whether you're listing art or products on other websites, such as Etsy, such as Amazon, such as eBay, such as Fine Art America, such as YouTube, all of those rely on the same kind of keyword research. Yes. And when you're plugging it into Google, the keyword, you notice that it has an autofill. So it gives you suggestions. So those are based on popularity. And so you'll also see like at the bottom of the page, you'll see searches related to that way. You can also get some more ideas around the words that people are looking for to search for. And just wanted to point out in terms of character lengths for your title tags, the title tag should be maximum of 60 characters. That's the clickable link that shows up on Google on the search results page. When you type in a search term, you'll come up with the results on the page. The title tag is usually the clickable link. And then you'll have the two sentence right beneath it, which is the meta description. And so those are the areas where you want to utilize your keywords from your research and make sure when you're doing your on-page optimization, you want to use the keywords in those areas. That's wonderful. Okay, so we learned so much here today. I want everybody to know that Glennis is offering my listeners a really special offer. If you want her to analyze your website, like she analyzed mine today, She's actually offering complimentary website reviews. However, this is for the first 10 people to sign up for and you have to do it by November 17th and they're going to go fast, probably much sooner than November 17th. So if you want to do that, go to my show notes. You'll be able to find the link to get the free website review as well as anything else we talked about during this show. And this is episode 112. So go to shulmanart.com forward slash 112. One more thing. Don't forget, if you like this episode, you have to check out the Artist Incubator Mastermind. Glennis did a training in there. We went even more in depth. You'll get to see her walk through different examples. So that's my private coaching program for professional artists who want to take their art business to the next level. It's by application only. Go to shulmanart.com forward slash biz as in B-I-Z. I'm already taking applications for 2021. The application and the interview totally free to apply and we'll discuss the steps you need to take to reach your goals and thrive. Okay, Glennis, do you have any last words for my listeners before we call this podcast complete? Like I said in the beginning that my mission is to take the mystery out of SEO, that it's not complicated. There are very simple strategies that you can use right away to get your website to start ranking organically on Google. And it's measurable. Don't forget to set up your Google Analytics and Google Search Console. I forgot to mention that, but, but that's very important because those are the ways that you can actually be able to measure your SEO performance. That way you can see, you know, how much search traffic you are getting, organic search traffic, how much social traffic, and how much is paid traffic. So yes, it is all measurable. Don't be afraid of SEO. It's, it's not all numbers. You can actually see the progress that you're making. There's ways to measure it. And just have fun with it. But remember, SEO takes time. So just be patient at the same time. But with SEO, unlike paid traffic, traffic stops once you stop paying for it. But with SEO, it's like a gift that keeps on giving. You put the effort into it. You'll see the results pay off in time. Oh, thanks so much for joining me here today. It was so fun having you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being with me here today. If you like this episode, please go to ratethispodcast.com forward slash inspire and let us know what you liked best about the show. For that free website review, go to shulmanart.com forward slash 112. All right. Thanks for being with me here today. See you next week. Same time, same place. Make it a great one. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course on shulmanart.com.